something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, everyone in between, welcome to episode two of Everything Breast with Beyond the Knife. Knife, 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 knife. With knife. our amazing special effects. So, this episode, we're going to continue on from the last uh, breast, everything about breast implants. And we're going to start with incisions. So, how do we get the breast implants into your body? And then the second thing we're going to talk about is above or below the muscle, which seems to stress out a lot of patients. So we're going to try and reduce anxiety around that. And the third part of this podcast will be a little history about, you know, fun facts and a grab bag of assorted breast implant knowledge that Dr. Plant and I have acquired over many years of doing breast implants. Well, the useless so let's, tools though. So let's start with incisions. You know, what incision, Dr. Plant, do you use or recommend or that you know of? Um... Yeah, I mean, my favorite incision, hands down, is the inframammary fold. I think I do that in probably 95 plus percent of cases. Um, the main reason that I love it is because it's directly at the breast. So I have really good visualization of the pocket I'm dissecting for the implant. I have, um, you know, the ability to use a pretty small incision because I don't have to send the implant very far. And... I think it's really well hidden within the crease and it's been shown to kind of have a lower rate of capsular contracture than, you know, going through the nipple, for example. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. So that inframemory fold, which guys, if you don't know the anatomy is the fold under the breast, it's, it's kind of where your bra sits and it cups under the breast, that line, that natural anatomic area is where I agree. You hide the incision there. Um, it's direct access. You can actually stay under the breast and, mm -hmm. you know, you can stay away from the nipple. You have the most access, the best visibility. Uh, I love it. I love that incision. Um, now other surgeons have popularized other, in, uh, approaches. So maybe you take one and I'll take one, but there is one that goes through the armpit. Um, mm -hmm. you know, some pretty big plastic surgeons, uh, in Toronto, like Dr. Lista, um, uh, and others, I'm not sure about who in the U.S. popular is popularizing that one, but you can actually put a, a small incision uh, through in the armpit and then slide the implant underneath the muscle uh, into its position on the breast. And so that's a technique I don't use, but I know how to do it. Uh, I don't I don't really like it because it's it's a little bit uh, blind. You have to kind of um, dissect. What I mean by blind is I don't lose my vision. When we, a surgeon says blind, it means you can't fully see what's happening. You are kind of, you know, using a light and you're using um, blunt dissection, which means, you know, not a knife. You're kind of um, spreading the tissues and then you put the implant down there. And surgeons get great results with these um, with technique, but it's not something I really use. What about you, Dr. Plant? I, I won't do that technique. Um, I do do through the armpit, but I'll do it endoscopically where I oh. can see what I'm doing. I can cauterize the vessels. Uh, for me, doing a bloodless breast augmentation is always the goal because I think blood is one of the contributors to capsular contracture. And um, I don't think you need to be a surgeon to imagine the difference in the amount of blood that collects in a breast implant pocket when, you know, with one option, you go in, you see the blood vessels, you cauterize them and then cut them so they don't bleed versus the other way of doing it where you basically stick a paddle in through the armpit uh, put it under the muscle and then start ripping the muscle <laughs> off the chest uh, savage and yes. just pulling those blood vessels apart like i think it's uh you can imagine how much bleeding goes on there and that's why that procedure usually has drains coming out for a day after or so right right uh, that's that's a good point uh and then the third uh or actually there's there's a couple of incisions we haven't talked about but there's another one that goes through the belly button and so um uh, you know, what you do is you make a small incision in the belly button, kind of same principle as the armpit approach. You dissect all the way up from the belly button into the, where the breast, where you want the breast implant to be. And then you slide the, I've actually seen them do this with silicone implants. So they, they make a, a very large pocket and slide it up. 
or more traditionally you use the saline, which is because you can get, make a very small tunnel and then fill it up in the breast implant. Do you ever do this approach through the belly button? No, I'm not, uh, I'm not really a fan of the tuba as it's yes. uh, called in uh, short form, uh, trans umbilical breast augmentation, uh, for those wondering what makes up that acronym. Um, I did not know you could do silicone through that. Like this is the first I've heard of it. I can only imagine what a stretched out belly button you'd have to have yeah. in order to be able to make, you know, a four or five centimeter incision there. But uh, it kind of incorporates everything that we've just said we don't like with some additional right. problems. So, you yes. know, neither of us like operating blind. You definitely cannot see what you're doing if you're going through the belly button. Uh, neither of us like, you know, essentially ripping things apart. And my understanding of the way you do this is even if you're doing a silicone implant, you still put in either a saline device or a saline sizer and you blow that up to kind of rip the muscle off of the chest. And I think I've kind of talked about why I don't like doing that. <laughs> and then also with the tuba, in addition to what happens with the transaxillary is because you're going through the inframammary crease, you're disrupting that natural fold, which then leaves you at an increased risk of bottoming out. Right. You've made a tunnel from below big enough to put your implant in. If you're not going to close up that tunnel at the end, it seems to me that it's highly likely that the implant is going to slide at least a little bit back down that tunnel. And then you're going to have to do some sort of revision, which is going to require an inframammary crease incision. And now we've got two separate incisions instead of having just done it through the crease the first time. And so a lot of our listeners might be saying, well, then why do people do these techniques? And the reason I would say is a couple, there's a couple of reasons. Number one is because we as plastic surgeons are inventive. We're, we always like to be innovative and to do new things because we always think there's a better way. Because <laughs> Sometimes there, there is a better way to do things. Uh, so I think that's one. And the second reason is because we love to hide scars. And, you know, if you think about it, putting it in the armpit or in the belly button is a beautiful way to hide the scar. There's no scar on the breast. But to me, I, I do agree with Dr. Plant. It's a lot of added risk an added complexity to an operation that doesn't need it because that intramammary fold incision in that natural crease usually is very well hidden and heals very well, uh, almost invisible. Like, of course, a surgeon can find it and of course patients can find it, but um, I don't think anyone uh, in, in regular daily living is, is going to find that scar or even if they do find that scar in you know, intimate moments, they're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, very turned off by it or or it's not gonna be too noticeable yeah like i say to patients if you are you know with a person who can now see the scar on your breast they've kind of passed that point where they care <laughs> that's a good that's a good point now there's one other incision which we 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 haven't talked about yet is the peri areolar or below the nipple um do you use this incision so by request i will after I explain why we shouldn't. And in cases where I do some revisions, I will go through the nipple if that's where their scar already is, just in the name of not making an additional scar, but right. definitely not my preferred incision. It probably is one of the most popular, like I would say between crease and, and periareolar, like those are your two far and away winners when you you know survey surgeons across the world. Yep. But I am not a fan of it you know, for a bunch of reasons, I kind of listed some of them when I was talking about why I like the crease, but, you know, increased risk of capsular contracture. Yes. Um, you know, you're putting the implant right through the breast itself instead right. of like, under it, making it under the breast, which, you know, adds scarring that can impact what they see on mammograms and ultrasounds. It can affect the ability to breastfeed more than going through the crease. Um, you're also putting the scar on the front of the breast rather than underneath it. And right. there's a it, lot of surgeons that for some reason tell patients, you can't get a bad scar on a nipple. Like the scar <laughs> always heals invisibly. And like, you know, this is one of the not true. where I straight up call out my colleagues and say, you're lying. That's not true. You know, it's not true. Scars don't ever disappear no matter where you put them. And you can have bad scars around the nipple. And if someone's going to form a bad scar, they're going to form a bad scar regardless of where you put it. So right. if they're going to have a bad scar, I would personally rather it be in the fold covered by the breast where it's just not visible under most circumstances, even standing naked, looking straight forward in a mirror. 
you probably won't see that. But if it's on the front of your breast, you can't hide that. Right. And I think that's a good surgery principle. I think we've talked about it before, but it's, you know, you, if you're going to have a bad scar, our job as plastic surgeons, because sometimes we can't control how your body makes the scar. We, we, we always aim to make the best scar possible, but there is genetic and, and individual factors that sometimes result in a poor scar. Um, and so we want to hide it. And if you have a scar right around your areola, there is no hiding that it's going to be a bad scar and it can happen. I get why surgeons want to do the periareolar. So as you guys know, with the breast, you know, the areola is usually darker than the surrounding skin. So it's very tempting to want to put a scar around the areola right in that transition line um, and camouflage it. But as you guys also know, or you, or you may not know, because Dr. Plant and I have seen a lot more areolas than an average person, <laughs> is that the areola usually transitions. It's not a sharp border. Mm -hmm. So you're putting a sharp cut in a gradual transition area. So where do you position the cut? Do you put it at the very edge of the transition? Do you put it in the transition? So I, I have done the periareolar for the same reason you have usually if it's a revision where they already had it, but even that I've stopped doing because I find I've, I've so much more control and so much more comfort uh, and reliability going through that IMF fold, even in a revision case uh, where um uh, I think it's just better to go through the IMF in almost all cases. Yeah, definitely agreed. Uh, so next, which we've, which we're going to go on to the next topic is above the muscle or below the muscle. Where do you sit on this super important debate that drives patients crazy? <laughs> um, so I think I sit on this where I sit with everything else. It depends on the patient and, uh, you know, all of the other things that we have to factor into the breast augmentation. Um, you know, what size is the implant? What type is the implant? Um, a lot of it, you know, is determined by coverage for me. Like if you're going above the muscle, you have to have enough breast tissue to cover the implant or you're gonna have rippling. It's gonna, you know, look like that orange stuck to the chest kind of thing. So there's definitely cases where below the muscle, I think if I had to like, pick a preference, it's definitely above the muscle whenever possible because it just makes sense anatomically. Um, I'm augmenting a breast. I should put the breast implant behind the breast, not behind the muscle that's behind the breast, unless 100%. I have a reason to do that. A hundred percent. So uh, I've heard all the evidence and all the lectures on both sides. I'm sure that you have, and I'm, I'm in the same boat. I do what's best for that particular patient. Um, if a patient has breast tissue, uh, you know, of a, of an amount that I think is going to sufficiently cover the implant, or at least provide some camouflage for the implant, then I'm going uh, over the muscle every time. If the patient is trans or the patient uh, has no breast tissue, then I'm going to go onto the muscle because I need something to cover uh, the implant with. Uh, and I always find it funny when you know, either surgeons or patients are like so black and white on this where they only do it one way or they only do it the other way. Cause that's not plastic surgery. We're always mm -hmm. modifying the particular operation for the, what's best for that uh, particular patient. Yeah. If it's not so complicated that it makes your head explode, it's not proper plastic. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Uh, now, okay. So then what about the hybrid, like a dual plane? How, are you a dual plane? So people who don't know dual plane, is this another way to make plastic surgery more complicated mm -hmm. is plastic surgeons came along and said, well, I like the benefits of under the muscle and I like the benefits of over the muscle. So why not do a hybrid where it's kind of under the muscle and it's kind of not under the muscle. What do you think of that? Yeah. So I think that's uh, you know, a great thing to bring up. Um, it's also important for patients to understand like the difference between under the muscle as it's sort of, you know, spoken of in lay terms versus, you know, what you and I mean when we talk about, submuscular, like if we were planning a case. So, right. um, you know, it used to be that implants were placed entirely under the pec muscle and you just stretch the muscle out and sort of what's done with those transaxillary silicone ones. But the muscle itself is still attached everywhere that it was always attached, except, you know, maybe in the middle of it. And it's just kind of stretched to accommodate the implant. Um, that was kind of shown to have a decreased rate of capsular contracture. So a lot of people have taken that and then said, I'm only going to do under the muscle now because of that decreased rate of capsular contracture, except 
the aesthetics of going purely under the muscle are often not great because the muscle sits higher than the breast mound for most yep. women. So you yep. end up with this really like tall, oval, weird shaped breast. Um, like a compressed, just, like a compressed implant. Yeah. Um, and you also get, um, you can get motion deformity when the, when you move your muscle, it can move the implant. And also what I found with those kind of cases is patients have prolonged recovery and a lot more pain than under the breast. When you go under the muscle, muscle is way more sensitive. Um, so that, that kind of like what Dr. Plan is, is, is describing was very popular with breast reconstruction because mm -hmm. you didn't have a choice when you're after uh, a mastectomy that you had to cover this implant and often the skin was radiated and damaged, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about cosmetic breast surgery. So, uh, you know, we, we, you really don't do this, but do you do a dual plane where it's, it's like, you're kind of half releasing the muscle and half putting it under the pocket, uh, under the breast? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm going under the muscle for any reason, it's dual plane. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever done a true sub muscular and I doubt that I ever will. Because right. I think it is important to drop that implant down to where it's supposed sure. to be. So uh, dual plane involves cutting the bottom of the pec muscle so that it's no longer attached towards the bottom of the breast. It then pulls up a little bit and kind of covers the top of the implant. And then the bottom of the implant is sitting just under the breast. So it's sort of said to give more of a sloped appearance at the top and a nice yes. a rounder fuller appearance at the bottom and then the implant can sit directly in the inframammary crease so it's kind of like the breast is in harmony you have the implant in the same location as the breast so it's much better from that perspective but a lot of people are still taking that data from true submuscular where there was the decrease in capsular contracture and trying to apply it to dual plane where I don't think there's any way that that applies anymore because you no. are now half subglandular. So there's no reason for these people to be like, I only do dual plane. That's the only pocket I go because of decreased capsular contracture and stuff like that. It doesn't that. apply. Yeah. But if I go under the muscle, that's the only way I go under the muscle. Right. And oftentimes I'll have patients that will say to me, Hey, I want to go under the muscle because my friend went under the muscle and I'll say, okay, but do you understand these there's drawbacks to everything? And, uh, oftentimes I can, you know, with the patient, if they really are set on a dual plane, even though I don't think they don't need it, I can still do it because I don't think it's harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as they're aware of the potential drawbacks to the dual plane, um, including, you know, bleeding recovery time that I found compared to, um, above the muscle. So now I think we've, we've covered two important topics. So hopefully listeners have less anxiety about those two, or we've given them more anxiety. Who knows? Let us know uh, what you thought of that. And then let's talk grab bag. So I think, you know, it's really cool to talk about the history of implants. You know, they've been around since the 1960s and you can imagine um, when they first started, how wild of an idea that was mm -hmm. uh, to uh, augment the breasts uh, with silicone. And the first generations of implants, I think right now we're in the eighth generation. This is when I, when I tell patients, like implants have been around a long time. They've been around 60 years. Um, that always impresses people because you don't realize, you know, you mentioned before that these are the most studied devices, but when they first did them, they weren't studied. They were basically mm -hmm. putting in any material uh, without testing it. And these first implants fell apart. It basically just kind of ruptured and spilled silicone all into the breast. And none of these implants stayed intact uh, from the first generation. Uh, have you ever had to take one of those puppies out, like those earlier generation implants? I actually have been uh, lucky enough to take out a first generation implant. It was actually intact, which was really cool. Wow. Um, so we we sterilized it, and like I have it kind of put away at the office for I don't know my museum of weird implants. Um, but it was really cool to see. It does not really look like what we're dealing with these days. It was a smooth anatomically shaped device that had uh, basically Velcro patches on the back of it because right. they wanted it to stick to the chest. Right. So this was kind of the initial idea. And, uh, you know, they were all good ideas in theory, but uh, there were problems with each of those aspects. And right. uh, over time, those have kind of been corrected. And also, uh, you know, sometimes what I'm sure Dr. Plan has seen before in other countries, 
where there's you know maybe less scrupulous or honest uh, medical professionals they actually inject liquid silicone into the breast which mm -hmm. at first you think oh that sounds like a good idea because it enhances the breast it's just a needle you don't have to go through surgery but this silicone can become infected um it can become uh a, a real difficult problem to remove oftentimes requiring a mastectomy have you ever had to take uh that out or been involved with one of those cases? I have luckily not been involved with any silicone in the breast. I've seen it in the face before, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is one of those things. It yes. sounds great in theory, inject it there, no incisions, and often it can look good for a couple of years, but the body reacts to foreign objects the same way, regardless of what that is, by forming scar around it. And when you have no structure to the device, like an implant has, that liquid silicone just ends up in these like balls of scar that we call granulomas that over time kind of contract the breast up, make it, you know, first feel lumpy and then look lumpy. And then, you know, these get infected and they start erupting with pus. And then, you know, someone's been in the hospital for months when dealing with this. So disaster. Uh, definitely not a fan of that technique. No. So if you or a friend are talking about silicone injections into the buttocks or breast, don't do it or tell, you know, make, we got to spread the word. That's not safe. Um, don't do it. Actually, one thing we forgot to mention is the gummy bear, but I feel like it fits into the history of implants pretty good because this term should be history. So what do you, what do you, what do you tell a patient when they say, doc, I want gummy bear implants? Yeah. So this is, uh, something that really grinds my gears to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's why I asked you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm really big on like precision when it comes to not just my surgical technique, but the language I use around surgery and the surgical product, like products. And there are two different kinds of silicone implants. Well, I mean, not real. there's more than two, but it all comes down to how firm is the gel inside. And this is because of that history we were talking about where silicone gel leaked all over uh, when it was more liquid. So it was made more cohesive is what it's called now and it sticks together. And most, well, all silicone implants now are made of cohesive gel, but the smooth round ones are not what I would call gummy bear. No. Um, gummy bear to me is the Solid. form stable, like really firm, anatomically shaped ones. Although there are now round ones that if you cut it in half, it's like cutting a gummy bear in half. Yes. Two halves of an implant. And that does not happen with smooth round implants. And like 99% of implants used cosmetically in North America are smooth round implants. And for some reason, 99% of office sales consultants happily call them gummy bear implants to patients when they are not gummy bear implants. Because gummy bear is like a marketing genius term. Everyone loves gummy bears. They're sweet. They're delicious. They're cute. Everyone wants gummy bear implants. I, I, like it's just a marketing genius term. And it's almost become so ubiquitous that I can't even tell a patient that it's not a gummy bear. I'm just like, is this a gummy bear implant? I'm like, kind of, <laughs> because I get what they want and I'm giving them what they want, but they're using an imprecise term. And it's almost like if you try to convince them that it, that's the incorrect term, they're going to go, well, the other, I'm going to go to that other plastic surgeon because he's going to give me gummy bear implants. It's like, no, he's not giving you, he's giving you high cohesive gel, you know, implants. They're not gummy bears, but if, if everyone else is calling them gummy bears, I guess now I got to call them gummy bears too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like a gummy bear left in the sun for a couple hours. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the Dr. Plant hit the, on the history, you know, which is, it's very interesting. So imagine, you know, you had these implants leaking everywhere. So the, the implant manufacturer geniuses said, okay, well, we're going to go the opposite direction and make the implants so stable. They're not leaking anywhere. And that's when you got the birth of the gummy bear. And they were just, they're actually like, like rocks. They're like too mm -hmm. firm. And so now we've kind of come uh, back away from those really, really stable gummy bear implants to what we have now, which is high cohesivity, which, you know, in, in just plain English terms is that when you cut open a current generation implant, that gel doesn't go anywhere. It just stays right there. It's not going to infiltrate the breast and cause all those problems that the implants did in the 1960s. Yeah. Important point. And, yeah. You know, good distinction. And, uh, you know, I think it's also a way to vet your surgeon. Um, you know, 
Dr. John Carroll, I'm going yeah. to be honest with you that it's not really gummy bears that you're getting. So if somebody's straight up telling you like, yeah, this is totally a gummy bear implant, um, <laughs> what else are they kind of glossing over? Yeah, that's a good point. And it, 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 it is funny because I do feel you know, that, that we work in very different environments now, mm -hmm. you know, I'm working in the U S uh, and, and compared to Canada, this is literally the wild West in terms of the marketing, the uh, people who do plastic surgery, right. There's like, you know, non-plastic surgeons here doing it. And so marketing is like a crazy animal uh, here in South Florida, uh, where I do feel that, you know, some clinics and some people are, are pretty loose with the terminology, pretty loose with the facts and pretty loose with, with, um, how they advertise, uh, because that's the market. Whereas, you know, in Canada, it's much more conservative and more honest, I believe. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a, a, a weird juxtaposition. Yeah. They will say anything they need to say to get you to put that deposit down. Right. And then, and, and it's just, that's the way it is. Right. And then you, if, since you have non-plastic surgeons doing uh, breast implant surgery, they maybe don't even know the history or the distinction, um, uh, between the different breast implants the way we had to, because that, that's our specialty, right? That was on our exam, like the generations of implants and the history. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you were maybe a family doctor just down here in South Florida doing implants, you may not even know the distinction. Yeah, great point. <laughs> luckily so, Eddie, in Canada, we don't have family doctors doing no, it anymore. No, no. And here you have, which I think should be another episode is, you know, what makes a plastic surgeon because here in the United States, the biggest kind of, I feel, I feel like controversy or battle is with board certified, um, uh, the board certification plastic surgeon and board certified cosmetic mm -hmm. doctors and cosmetic surgeons who I think are con confused consumers to um, take advantage uh, of the kind of reputation and brand that plastic surgeons have earned and done. So they're kind mm -hmm. of like calling themselves cosmetic surgeons to blur that distinction, but there is a real difference. So oh, you yeah. know, I'm kind of going off, uh, off the res reservation here, but maybe that's another episode. Oh, that's it's not something an episode, how to, choose, uh, <laughs> surgeon, um, how to make sure your surgeon is a surgeon. Yeah. 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 There, there's actually a news story, uh, here in Florida, uh, just last week where uh, a woman was arrested mid rhinoplasty was not a plastic surgeon was not even a licensed doctor. I don't know if you saw that one. I, I did actually read about that. That was crazy. Yeah. And for people who didn't, who missed the story, the reason she got caught was because a guy had a rhinoplasty with a very uh, poor outcome and he went to follow up with her and she was kind of blowing him off. And so she, he did his research on her, look, tried to look up her license that didn't exist, tried to like Google her information. Then he went to the cops and then the, the cops arrested her for impersonating a doctor. And I feel like that happens here in South Florida on like a monthly basis. You have, I think there's so much money and there's so much um, marketing and advertising that, you know, these, these dishonest and frankly criminal people mm -hmm. take advantage like, yes. who's doing a, how do you do a rhinoplasty? One of the most complicated operations. <laughs> you're not a, even a trained, not, you're not trained to anything. Like it's just wild. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw the picture of the guy who complained and that's how you do a rhinoplasty. If you're not an actual oh, plastic surgeon, it yeah. was pretty brutal. But what I'd like to know is if she was arrested mid operation, meaning that nose was probably sitting there open on the table and they took her out in handcuffs. What happens at that point? Um, that's a good, that's a really good point. Did they let her imagine? finish? Does the patient get woken up and taken to a legit surgeon? Do they get taken to a hospital, to the emergency room to get finished? That is a great question because it's kind of like analogous to the police walk in on a crime being committed. You don't let the criminal finish the crime, but in this crime, it's there's a human being that's being operated on. So that is a, you know, when you read the article, it's mid operation, but maybe it was like, you know, they're putting the bandages on, or maybe it was at the, I, like, I, I don't know, but if the nose was wide open, what did happen? The police wouldn't know how to <laughs> close the poor nose. And I don't even mean to make light of the situation, but that is a wild, it's a wild story. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely an episode. Uh, <laughs> classic <it's> like... <laughs> Miami. That's classic <laughs> Miami right there. <laughs> it's not even wild down here. It's like, uh, it's <laughs> just a Tuesday. <laughs> Just Tuesday in Miami. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, anyway, and then any other, so any other fun, okay. One other implant thing I can remember was 
that they use Teflon uh, coated implants for a while. Oh no, sorry, Gore-Tex. It was Gore-Tex uh, or, or some other chemical. Urethane was, foam, I think. Yes, where they were trying to coat it to prevent capsular contracture, mm -hmm. but the degradation of the product, it was actually cancer causing. So not to scare anyone else, but this is another kind of the evolution of implants where literally everything has been tried uh, to uh, reduce problems. So as we already said, you know, if they're leaking, make them harder. If they're causing a uh, capsular contracture, let's try a different substance. So mm. that's when to reassure you that now we're in our eighth generation, you know, most of these trial and errors were done before Dr. Plant and I were even, you know, uh, walking this earth, let alone <laughs> plastic surgeons. <laughs> so we yeah, are lucky. We literally in, in Europe, in parts and uh, in Asia and parts, they're still using those ones despite really? what happened wow. with it. Yeah. Because wow. it is good on capsule contracture. It's just, you know, you know, the cancer sucks. Right, right, right. So I, I think, you know, it's one of those things we could have an episode on this where we literally stand on the shoulders of giants because we get to take advantage of all these amazing um, uh, advancements and the trial and errors mm -hmm. that have occurred. Uh, in medicine to get us to this point where I think they've pretty much perfected the implant. I think, you know, uh, as implants go or as medical device go, like you alluded to, the complication rates are extremely low. They're, ext they're extremely reliable. Nothing is perfect in life. The same goes with the implants, but as devices go, they're pretty good devices. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about maybe um, some of the bad ideas that came, um, you know, like a hundred plus years ago, you <laughs> Um, when it came to breast augmentation before that sort of, uh, you know, gave someone the idea that maybe we should make some sort of like medical grade uh, breast implant. You want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff people tried? Well, I think, I think I know, I know what we kind of touched on it, but you know, before they did implants, the big fad, or I guess the crate was just injecting different substances in. So I know people injected water, injected oil, injected different substances, which would give the enhancement, but it wouldn't last for various reasons. I mean, if you just inject water, the body's going to absorb it. If you inject oil or um, other substances like the silicone, how we said, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So, uh, but I can't think what else was it like, uh, are you talking about, I think there's something like potato or it's like a vegetable or something. Somebody put something in there like way back before, is that what you're alluding to? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't remember vegetable, <laughs> but I'm sure somebody tried it at some point. But uh, I know I've read they used um, like cotton wool at some point, like basically like yes. a cotton yes. ball and shove that in there. Uh, they've tried wax, they've tried marbles. Um, and the first breast augmentation actually was uh, someone took a lipoma out of one area on a patient. Yes, I remember this. Yeah, that's genius because we've yeah. come full circle because now fat transfer is basically that. And that's kind of yeah. like the hottest area of plastic surgery. And that was like that, 1867. So that person was a genius. what have we been doing for 150 years? <laughs> uh, oh, you know, I have a, uh, an interesting thing to bring up is pain management after breast surgery. Mm. So uh, do you, what do you do for pain management uh, to help people recover kind of from a breast augmentation? Yeah, this is another thing that kind of grinds my gears a little bit because of this marketing of the 24 hour flash recovery breast augmentation, which, um, to be honest, is kind of how the recovery should be with any breast augmentation done properly using, you know, modern atraumatic techniques and stuff like that. But right. I am a big fan of, uh, it's called multimodal analgesia. Uh, Same. And uh, for those of you out there who uh, have not had any medical training, that basically means using a bunch of different things. Right. So I use, uh, basically, as I explain it to patients, I use three different things together as baseline that are pretty benign. And then that minimizes the amount of the narcotics they need. So I have them on Tylenol all the time for like the first five days, just to kind of minimize how the brain is receiving the pain signals. I have them on uh, Lyrica to kind of slow down those nerve impulses, taking the pain from the site to the brain. And then I have them on an anti-inflammatory uh, to kind of decrease the pain at the site. So we sort of hit it in all three locations where you can, and then I'll give them some codeine 
on top of that, but I would say 95% of my patients need one codeine the night of surgery. And by the next day, they're kind of like back up doing their daily activities for the most part. Uh, what do you use? Uh, I use multimodal as well. I use uh, Tylenol, ibuprofen, and tramadol. Uh, and I'll hold off on the narcotics unless the tram. Some patients have a lot of nausea with the tramadol, and some patients maybe just for psychological reasons or for historical reasons, just need like a Percocet or need like uh, an opioid and I'll, I'll use it, but it's very sparingly, very case by case. But actually the biggest difference that I found is using um, a, a local anesthetic that I inject into the lateral chest wall in the pocket that makes the biggest difference. And mm -hmm. I use the long acting. So XPRL, I don't know if they've approved it yet in Canada, no but it's basically, it. damn it. <laughs> it's basically li liposomal lidocaine, which for people that are listening, it's, it's, it's a, it's with the same thing your dentist used to inject in your teeth when you're having a dental procedure that makes it go numb, but last 48 hours. So you can imagine the advantages of this, you know, when you wake up, sometimes it takes a little, it's funny. Sometimes it takes a little bit to kick in. It's not like instantaneous the way you'd think because you know lidocaine is so mm -hmm. fast with the liposome it takes a little bit of more time to kick in so sometimes they wake up and it's a bit sore but then by that night it's numb and they're numb for like two days and they can they actually tell me i can feel when it's wearing off because then it starts getting sore again at like it's weird because they didn't feel anything for two days so i feel like that's been the biggest game changer uh, uh for me but the multimodal is also you know, something awesome that uh, can avoid a lot of complications that occur with opioids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do do um, the local anesthetic, but we use our uh, low budget Canadian version. Yeah, mix. Old yeah. school Marcane. But I do actually, I forgot that point. I do think it's important to uh, put that in. I do it before we even start the surgery because nice. theoretically, even though the patient's asleep, uh, the body still perceives that they've been cut. Right. It starts this whole inflammatory process and like starts the pain receptors and uh, positive feedback loops and all kinds smart. of smart stuff that uh, we, we knew in detail back in the day. Um, so we put local right into the incision site, let it kind of chill for about 10 minutes. And then even though the patient's under anesthesia, their body doesn't register that they've been cut. So I think right there, it decreases the baseline pain from yeah. the start. I like it. But I wish I had that. Uh... <laughs> you will. You'll get it. I'm sure. It's such a good product. It'll come to Canada. It'll just probably be like triple the price. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All I want for Christmas is some Xperel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think, you know, we're, we've summarized everything about um, breast. The only thing we didn't kind of touch on maybe is the post-op recovery. Do you use massage? Do you use supportive bras? Do you use any other techniques to help them recover after the, they've had breast implants? Or advice. Yeah, that's a good, uh, good point. Because that's another thing that like, take 10 plastic surgeons, ask them what the right way to recover someone is, you'll get 10 different techniques. Yep. Um, so I don't rely on anything after surgery, I don't trust, you know, bras to hold up implants. Um, I Taping. don't <laughs> like massages. Uh, so I secure things internally. So patients can go braless if they want, we just give them a special kind of supportive bra for comfort, um, but definitely not expecting that bra to hold anything in place. Like that needs to be done in surgery. And uh, I am a huge anti-massager. Um, as someone who does a lot of revision work and uh, you know has to do capsulectomies on people who have massaged, it is a nightmare to deal with those giant capsules. And I've taken so much time during surgery and put so much effort into making this like really precise pocket that is basically exactly three millimeters wider than your implant. The last thing I want you to do is start shoving that implant around in your body and making the pocket bigger. But this is something that a lot of surgeons kind of do and nothing necessarily wrong with it if it works for them. Uh, what's your sort of thoughts on recovery? So yeah, so I like the support of bra. I agree with you. Everything's got to be uh, suspended and supported internally. Uh, but just while things are healing and that kind of support has time to kind of solidify uh, and scar and heal the way it's supposed to be, I, I tell them, listen, you got to wear this supportive bra, no underwire for six weeks. Um, you know, you can take it off to shower, but you should put it right back on just until things are, are healed. I also don't like the idea of massage for breast implants 
right after for the same reason. I've created a very precise pocket. I don't want you messing around with it. Just leave them alone. <laughs> and so uh, you know, I'm a huge proponent, as you know, I think we've talked about for BBL massage, uh, abdominal plastic massage, but I agree with you. I'm putting that implant very precisely where I want it and I want it to stay there. Um, now, one exception, if someone is developing capsular contracture, I do recommend massaging to try and break up that capsule. Um, does that work? Is it anecdotal? It may be, but I do, I have found that when I prescribe the patients, um, oh my God, why, why is that medication not coming to my singular. mind? But Which? Singular. Yeah, singular. That's the one. When I prescribe singular and massage uh, together, I can get a stage one capsule to kind of resolve on its, on its own. Uh, so do you recommend massage in that case or, or, or not? Um, I always recommend massage when there's problematic scarring, but I do tell patients, like, I don't sure. really think that this is going to improve your situation. Um, you know, the they're not going to do it. They help. Um, but chances are this is going to, you know, potentially get a little bit worse and we may have to do something surgically about it. Um, one thing I don't do that they used to do uh, is the closed capsulotomy. Have you ever seen one of those? Um, <laughs> no, I've only read about it. I've never done one. I've actually never seen someone do it. Uh, it sounds extremely painful. Mm -hmm. So you explain it for people, maybe in, in plain English, what, what it was, what it entails. Yeah. So, um, you know, fancy medical term capsulotomy just means opening the capsule. And now we would do that open, which means you make an incision, you see what you're doing, and then you make an incision in the capsule. But there was this technique called closed capsulotomy that used to be pretty popular, like in the mm -hmm. 80s, even in the early 90s, where a patient would come in with a contracted breast implant. And instead of taking them to surgery to remove the capsule and replace the implant, which would be sort of, you know, what we try now, um, right in the office there, they would have the patient lie on the table, and basically the surgeon would just grab their breast with two hands and squeeze as hard as humanly possible until break they, the capsule, which yeah. they assumed was the capsule rupturing. And then, you know, things would get soft, but I think in a lot of those cases, it was the capsule and the implant rupturing. <laughs> it's a very barbaric technique. I think the, the principle I get, but I agree. We've, we've moved away from that. If there's a capsule, you either remove it or remove the implant surgically <laughs> yes you should see what you're doing Always not manually okay well i think that literally is everything about implants you know we've gone uh, in very high depth so thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode of beyond the knife, 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 knife. <laughs>